Hello, my name is Larry Long. I'm the executive director of Community Celebration of Place, which is the nonprofit that oversees Elders Wisdom Children's Song, for which I created over 30 years ago. This year, we decided to focus on specifically honoring men of color. So what we did is we focused with the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade and to honor three elders who are African American men of color. One of whom was the principal of Lucy Laney, David Branch. Another was Edgar Young Jr., who works in the school. And then Reverend Coleman, who is beloved in North Minneapolis. And what's amazing about this project is each of the elders came in, gave their life story to the children for over two hours. Every child asked them a critical question. Their spoken word became written word, and from their written word, we created the songs, the narratives, and the illustrations. While doing this project at Lucy Lanning, I found those who are really engaged with young people because they truly love them. And education isn't so much about making a living, but it's to make a life. And we're giving birth to something, I think, that can have great power and can be transferable for other schools and communities to use, hopefully for generations to come, and to keep improving on it. I am Dequita Nash. I am the Community and Family Engagement Specialist for Lucy Laney School. The process has been enlightening. It's been a great mixture of like community and opening new windows for the students and new experiences that they may have never had before. When he walked in, I'm thinking he was like, some big time businessman until he sat down and talked to us and told us about his story and stuff. And I was like, that's cool. I, I think my, my journey uh, as a black man is very, um, uh, is somewhat unique. Um, here in the history, about Martin Luther King and segregation and all that. I lived there. We were in segregated schools. Uh, there were, in Tallahatchie County, there was a school for white kids and there was a school for black kids. People would actually take time to speak to like, young black gentlemen, like, just not let them just be on the streets. His life was like crazy, but soon he got older, he, he got better and started how to read and stuff. Which, when he was younger, he didn't really know how to read and write. They said, well, we won't go back to the balcony. We We'll go and, and worship on our own. We won't bother you any longer. So it was a freedom of religion expression uh, that led to the formation of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Students think that the only things that they see exist or the only things that they go through are what exists when in reality there are a lot of other things happening to other people in, in, in the world. The inspiring part to me was when he basically was uh, talking about um, him just being proud from all uh, white folks calling him the N-word. Their parents are uh, of different races, and they know that they're of mixed race. So then how do, how do they self-identify, and then how does society identify them? Sharecropping is, it always kind of reminds me of slavery a little bit. It's a, another way of keeping people in bondage, you know? David Branch. He told us about how, how his life was when, when he was in high school, middle school, and stuff like that. And he told us um, how, how to get through the struggle without making a fight. How did you meet your wife and how did you know she was the chosen one? How did you deal with gangs trying to get you to join? How would, how would your life be different now if you had been raised in Chicago? How did you deal with peer, peer pressure in high school? What inspired you to be a baseball player? Um, was people segregated back in, your, back in your time? Find people in your life who can lift you up and be humble and realize that they have something you don't have and you can learn from them. And if each and every one of you will find people like that in your life, you'll find yourself succeeding and you'll find that other people will want to associate with you for the very same reason. My name is Toki Wright. I have been working with the seventh and eighth grade young men transcribing the words that from the elders into hip hop form. My name is Jeremiah Bay. I'm a visual artist and illustrator. 
um, and a painter, and uh, I was here to help the, help the youth, help the students turn the lyrics they wrote into song books, almost like miniature comic books, using the uh, raps they wrote as narratives. What's up? My name is Julia Sewell, and I was a spoken word poetry teacher for the Elders of Wisdom Project. There's always value when you transfer one type of wisdom into multiple ways, right? So for young people, they might not be able to hear an elder talk for an hour long, but they might be able to sit and listen to that same talk condensed in a five-minute spoken word piece or five-minute hip-hop rap, right? So what we're doing and the power of what we're doing is we're, we're translating that wisdom into the uh, language that our young people can understand. You're reflecting back on, oh, how my life has changed, right? So you can say it like that as well. What we would do is we would take the transcribed conversations that they had with the elders and we would break it up into themes and we would take those themes and rewrite those themes in, our, in their own language. You have to be a follower. Uh -huh. We can say, uh, the world is a jar and you hold it in your hand. Um, and it's, cool. it's, uh, I have a lot of barriers in life, but you live through it every day and night. All the months I hear him making tight. So you gotta tight, you gotta cut it out. It's exceeding, right? The creativity that a lot that these kids have. Um, uh, but the technical know-how uh, of how to, you know, execute an image or tell a story visually, uh, those things are always a part of uh, uh, the learning process. So uh, I gotta be impressed by your drawing. This story of um, coming from poverty or coming from single parent homeness or going through struggle, overcoming struggle, setting a goal to be successful, then becoming successful, right? Then failing, then getting back up, right? These themes of life. It was like, I got used to end us and put us down. When we stand up for ourselves, they had a frown. When they stand up for ourselves, yeah. they had a frown. Issues of racism, issues of dealing with women in the inner city, issues of being in the South versus the North. Uh, talking about discipline, the importance of, of being self-disciplined. The boys were able to recognize that even though their elder was born, you know, 40 to 50 years before they were, they're still able to connect with these major life themes of uh, being young, black, and male in America. I, I say that the process, it hasn't always been easy. It's had a lot of difficulty just getting everybody on board and getting them focused on, on creating. When you have a bunch of side conversations and stop and talk all the time, it's really annoying. It's really annoying. It's really annoying. It's really annoying and disrespectful. Always collaborating with a, a large group of young folks is a, is a challenge. Uh, you get one or two or three or even five young folks and uh, you've got their undivided attention. Uh, and once you start to get beyond that number, uh, you become a little bit of a, uh, a wrangler. Well, it's, you know, when you're working with young boys, lots of energy is always challenging to focus one's energy. But I think once you get beyond um, that initial excitement and you learn to channel your energy and you teach the boys to channel their energy, you get more um, out of the process. Just because we're working on this group does not mean that you all have the freedom to play. You all should be taking notes from the notes that we give them and saying, okay, well, if they're working on this, maybe I should work on my lines in, in, in a similar way. Being able to allow a certain degree of chaos, you know, you're like, okay, I got these kids over here working, uh, and those kids over there are acting up, but I'm gonna make sure that these kids are got a good trajectory before I go deal with that. And then you go, <laughs> then you, you know, once you've got this handled, you go to the other side of the room, you get those kids working. It's difficult to go from a boy to a man. But there's a lot of challenges you have to understand. So the energy's perfect. Now we gotta, we gotta stay on beat. Yeah. So watch, watch my hand and bounce to the rhythm of my hand. Okay. I think the elders of wisdom project should be in schools because it is important to remind our young people of how powerful the communities are that they come from 
and it's also important for them to see older people that look like them that reflect their neighborhood their history their community inside of the school in a role of power they seem to be more engaged knowing that they have a lot of say on what the finishing product is and that they what they get what they put into it is what they're going to get back from it in return we need to close the gap between the generations that came before us and the generations that are, are being brought into the world. I think that to have these kids working on a project and turning these narratives of these elders um, into musical genres that the elders themselves may or may not be listening to, you know, uh, and to infuse like that, that elder wisdom into uh, these hip hop narratives, I think is uh, uh, in a lot of ways, um, it's sort of like the essence of hip hop, and and, and also it's uh, it, it also feels sort of new. It raises awareness, and it also um, raises investment in our young people into their community. It's our duty to connect generations and connect groups of people that are all in the same lineage. And who better to give guidance than people that have gone through it and have same experience of being a young man it may have been in a different era but a lot of the same issues that have happened to our, our elders are the same issues that come up with our young people he gave his friend a second chance when he called him a nigger everybody's gonna need to deserve a second chance so like i see my dad all the time so when i see him i'm giving him a second chance i think sometimes kids have to grow too fast especially you know the black community because the father figure is something usually not there. If you see um, an image over and over again, a similar type of image, you know, firefighters running from burning buildings, right? That you're gonna have an understanding of, like that's what firefighters do, even if you've never interacted with one. And I think that a similar thing happens when you are repeatedly seeing, um, you know, black and brown people uh, in handcuffs or black and brown people get beat up by the police or black and brown people in jail. Uh, those images start to be ingrained kind of in, this, in a similar way. People can be that mean, then I think people can change. So I'm gonna just like change my ways of thinking about white folks because that was like the past. Now this is like the present. So I'm gonna just like not not think about what white folks did back then. Like you're going through something, it's always somebody who's going through something worse. When you think you know something, it's always somebody who knows more than you, or knows better. Especially if they're elders, because. Like, whatever you want to do, they want to do, like, <coughs> ten times already. You know, a lot of young people don't get the opportunity to, you know, think for themselves or be given an open framework to think for themselves. And it was really cool just to see them develop. Every time I enter a space full of creative energy, I'm instantly transformed. So, I was so um, blessed to be a part of raw energy, raw emotion, raw thought, raw talent. We're going to need to find new ways of being able to, to access that information. Um, and this to me, uh, uh, at, at least for the kids who are involved and hopefully for the kids that are able to listen to the music, um, it seems like a really um, tangible and excellent way to access that kind of wisdom. This work is all about a partnership. It's not about doing something for somebody. This work is about doing work with others. So there's no stars that shine greater than others in this project. It's all about community, it's about the generations to come, and it's about the generations that are here. And we need to simply create more opportunities, not just from the old to the young, but from the young to the old. And through listening to the story of another, you begin to gain empathy. And when you gain empathy, you end up having a greater love and compassion for others. And by doing so, uh, hatred and bigotry and racism begins to move aside for a greater power, which is love. Out of this has come wealth beyond measure. It's taken a lot of work. It's been difficult, hard work. But I will tell you this, that out of pain and out of struggle comes joy and blessing if one is willing to work through it. Because the fact is, different cultures and people, we all express ourselves in uniquely different and appropriate ways. So what it takes to bring together the many nations of people is a lot of patience, tolerance, forgiveness. 
And when you're willing to kind of embrace that and allow the fruits of this word for the generations to bear fruit, what you get is this. or 40 years, what kind of legacy that they'll leave um, us as well. 